ISIS in the State of Israel happens, as they say, not in a vacuum. It happens in the Cold War. Many of the people in this audience tonight are old enough to remember the Cold War, which has come and gone, perhaps. It's not gone, right? Nobody knows where Russia is headed, but the old classic Cold War of 1945 to 1990 uh, defined the young lives of many of us. And it's the bipolar world with America versus Russia, the Soviet Union. And it has very specific origins. And it didn't happen overnight, but it happened. And as you and I know, it profoundly affected uh, everything connected with the Middle East and particularly the state of Israel. And therefore, as a historian, I have to devote a lot of time to context because history is all about context. Um, who are you? Uh, where you come from? Who are your parents? Uh, where'd you go to school? Who are your friends? Uh, where do you live? What do you do for a living? These are your context to tell me who you are rather than just a simple statement of, my name is so-and-so, I'm this many years old, and I live in, you know, I do this and that. You know, if I want to know who you are, I need the context. And same thing here, if we want to know what happened with uh, Eretz Yisrael, how did it emerge that there should be, in the wake of the Holocaust and the Second World War, there should arise something called uh, the State of Israel. I mean, where, what? Uh, what was going on in the world at that time? Uh, was there a vacuum? Was there simply a, a, a move by the Jews to set up a state, and there's no opposition to it. I mean, obviously, you understand that if you want to get a historical picture of this, you have to know what's going on in, in general. And anyway, you know, check that out. Now, the year is 1945 to 49. Years that I've devoted for this lecture series are the years that the Cold War developed. they are also the years that Israel came to be, so that's interesting. It wasn't there in 1945, but it certainly was there in 1949. And it profoundly affected everything, including the establishment and, and, the, and the future of the State of Israel. It's hard for us today to recall, to understand even, that so much of what happened in the 20th century was caused by communism or the threat of communism. And that's just interesting. Uh, civil rights, uh, unions. Are crushing national debt. Everything is there either because of communism or because they felt they got to do something to compete so they shouldn't go communist. In reality, why was there a successful civil rights movement here in the wake of the Second World War? Did racism all of a sudden go away overnight? They were scared about the appeal of communism and that America has to be able to compete in the Cold War. But why did the unions have their golden years in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, let's say, and 70s, before they slit their throats and took all the business to Mexico and places like that. Uh, because as long as the Cold War was on, uh, they were afraid of alienating the American workers. They wanted to keep them nice and happy and fat. And they did. And so they had the highest standard of living and the highest uh, you know, uh, uh, wages of any uh, workforce in the world. Same thing in, East, in Western Europe. How come all of a sudden, at the end of the Second World War, every single country without exception wants to go socialist, and whatever they do, they want to deliver the goods to the workers. Everybody all of a sudden became a tzaddik, uh, they're afraid of the appeal of Russia. And so the threat of communism <laughs> itself caused many, many things to happen. And you and I are, and the country, I mean the United States of America, is suffering under the gigantic debt because we had to pay for the Cold War in addition to doing the, all the other things. True or not? I mean, those missiles at the end of the day actually cost money. And as Senator Dirksen said, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. So it's not a small thing that I'm talking about. And so what I have to address here tonight is uh, the origins of the Cold War, which take place in this time. And in order to understand this, I can't help this. Historically, you've got to go back <laughs> to the Second World War itself, which had two faces. Uh, the Second World War was an ideological war for freedom, but it was also a good old-fashioned European balance of power war. <laughs> OK? I mean, that's, that, that's what it was. Now, throughout history, especially in Europe, is what you call the balance of power. If one country or a set of countries gets too strong, they eat up the other countries. That's the way of the world. But not everybody's like Canada, that you're next to a big United States and they don't take them over. Okay? Usually it's not like that in history. If there's a big fish, they swallow the small ones. And so what happened long ago in Europe and the Middle East and places like that is, whenever one, set of one group gets a little too strong, the others scramble to somehow or other provide countervailing force in order to prevent that. So Europe 
And World War II is about that. I mean, you had Russia, you had Germany, you had England and France. If one gets, as a matter of fact, one could argue that, the, like Churchill said in the 1930s, because the British and the French didn't arm sufficiently, Hitler got too strong and then upset the whole apple cart. And then the whole war was about trying to prevent one country, Germany, from dominating all the others. In which case, you could be isolationist. You're an American, you say, what do I care about all that? Huh? On the other hand, Second World War was also a ideological war for freedom because Hitler represented fascism, as we all know, and rejection of democracy, and really a, a, a nightmare scenario. Not even, not only if you're Jewish, of course, but even otherwise. And so these factors are built into it because in this ideological crusade for freedom that we fought in the Second World War, and we did, and you have the greatest generation and all that business, uh, we were hooked up with Stalin, <laughs> true or not, who was not that, and how do you explain that? And the answer is, the American people, for the overwhelming majority, understood, hey, it's also a balance of power for it, too, right? And we need somebody to help us fight against them. Uh, recently, uh, we had the, uh, what would you call it? The war, the first war against Saddam Hussein, with George Bush Sr. Uh, then America hooked up with Saudi Arabia and all the other countries, uh, who are not exactly what you call poster boys for freedom, because everybody understood you need to allies. And so how do you work all this out? Uh, the balance of power is something the United States officially has never felt comfortable discussing in American textbooks and, ide uh, and, and idea idealism. But it's baloney. Uh, George Washington, let's see here. Yeah. George Washington's famous policy of isolationism, I know you know what I'm talking about, was really baloney. It was all based on the fact that Britain maintained the balance of power in Europe and the British Navy controlled the seas. And so we got off scot-free for 120 years as a nation we didn't have to pay for an army and very little for a navy because no way that France, Russia, Spain, all these other countries can really come over here. The British control the navy and they're not going to let anybody over. And Britain after the War of 1812 also saw it's not going to be able to invade the US which is such a big country successfully. And so the American tradition, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, is to have no army. In the 1800s, the United States Army from top to bottom was about 20,000 men for a whole country like ours. Think about that. And that's the way people wanted it. So it reminds you a little bit about Japan. One of the reasons Japan had a good economy is they didn't have to pay what we had to pay for the Army, the Navy, the missiles, and all this other stuff. Suppose you cut today the defense budget <laughs> down to almost nothing. We would save a few pennies. True? It would make a big dent in the national debt unless they squandered the uh, money that they saved. And so these are not small issues that are in there. By the time of the Second World War, the balance of power, Le Misa, in Europe, was between uh, Germany and Russia. Because these are the two countries that built up their industry and that built up their military. That's the bottom line. These are the two strong uh, nations over there. There's a lot that could be said on this. I'm just giving you the bare uh, facts over here. But they were the countries that had the really strong and tough armies. England, at this time, if you know, did not have an army. It was like 75,000 men. And France had an army, but it t people thought it was strong, but it wasn't. And so it wasn't a really tough army. Uh, Germany and Russia did. If either Germany or Russia got too strong, they could conquer Europe, and that means in those days, if you conquer Europe, you can conquer the world. Well, who's going to take you on? Africa? Uh, Antarctica? Uh, you know, uh, South Asia? Get it? They didn't, didn't have any technology. And so this is the basic plan. If Russia or Germany got too strong, they could take over the world. Now, communism, which took power in Russia in 1918, aimed from day one at world conquest. You just have to understand that. This is the basic policy of Lenin, and uh, those who know will recall, he tried to launch revolutions in all the countries that he could. They didn't quite work, but there were communist attempts at revolution, 1918, 1919, all through the 1920s and all that, in Germany and in, uh, I don't know, in Belgium and in Bulgaria and Hungary and, you know, wh wherever the possibilities were to do that. And uh, uh, the reason is, because the basic sheet of communism is, in order for it to work, it has to spread throughout the whole world. I don't have to give you a lesson in Marxism and Leninism, but you get the basic idea that in order for it to work, it's got to be an international uh, phenomenon. Okay? And so Russia is potentially, as we all know, is very strong, very powerful. It's got the size and it's got the population for that. But Russia was very weakened by World War I, which they lost, by the huge civil wars that raged in Russia after World War I, the whites versus the reds, in which another couple of millions and zillions of people were killed and then the starvation that kicked in over there. If some of you may recall, Herbert Hoover, I talked about this, 
the American Railroad had to go over to Russia and they had to basically give him whatever he wanted because he was partially sending food over there. People were starving by incredible numbers. Uh, whole populations died this way. Uh, and so the decision was made by the Soviet leadership, Stalin really, that they're going to do what they call a revolution in one country, they're going to consolidate power in the USSR. And then, after they get real strong in one country, they'll look at the world and try to take it over when the time comes, uh, Mir Tzashem, you know, in the right time. And that's why they launched their, uh, what they call, five-year plans, which means, this, I'll tell you exactly what it means. You're going to, take, you're going to charge everybody very high taxes, um, I mean, very high taxes. You're going to take all the tax money, almost all of it, and put it into uh, weapons and the creation of, a, of an industrial infrastructure for the military. You understand? And if there's not enough food to go around, too bad. And if you don't have shoes, one day you'll have shoes, but now you won't have shoes. And so on and so forth. You know, don't expect to have any kind of uh, standard of living, uh, but the country will get uh, factories to create tanks and airplanes, and they'll have the electric power and the dams and all that kind of business in there. And it was a ruthless plan of, you know, uh, as they say, industrialization, and millions died in that process as well. But the basic idea, of course, was that they're going to uh, create a, a powerful state. And, uh, and they kind of did. And so by the 1930s, uh, Russia was chugging along at creating the largest and most powerful country in the world. And that's what it boiled down to. It was the anomaly that people my age are familiar with, which is it was a poor country with a very rich military. Right? It was a poor country that didn't have the kind of industry that you would associate with a poor country. So it was very anomalous in this uh, kind of way. The plan was to build up a gigantic military power and then eventually conquer the world. This is the basic sheet of Stalin. Uh, so, because as I tell before, he knew also socialism doesn't work so well. You can't have a worker's paradise in a country uh, like Russia, which is backwards. You see? If you get the whole Europe in, you get the whole America in, and all that, then somehow or other, it'll come together in the right kind of way, and it'll work out. Other than that, it'll be truncated and awkward and skewed. Uh, now, Stalin was also very crafty. And using the president of the First World War, he planned to get the other European countries to destroy each other, and then he would swoop in and pick up the pieces. This is the classic policy of Stalin and others in history. It's not a dumb one either, in which you get A to fight B and B to fight A, and then you move in. After all, doesn't Israel wish today that uh, you know, uh, Jordan and uh, you know, saw Egypt and uh, Syria would all uh, you know, wipe each other out? I mean, that'd be the best. Uh, I still remember back in the 1980 or so when Iraq declared war when Iran, Saddam Hussein at that time, and they asked Menachem Begin, uh, who does Israel favor? He said, I wish I'd slug on both sides. You understand? <laughs> well, because who are they supposed to favor? You understand? So uh, this was Stalin's uh, plan. Let the European, it's, it's basic, it's part of the religion of communism. Like I say, I don't want to get too bogged down in this, but they really do believe ideologically, that what they call the internal uh, contradictions of capitalism will lead one day to the different capitalist countries fighting and destroying each other. And then we'll move in with our gigantic army. And you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, the stupidest idea in the world. Um, uh, the problem with the plan, of course, was the unexpected rise of Hitler in, his, in Hitler's Germany in the 1930s. This created a powerful state that had the possibility of beating Russia, particularly if it teamed up with England and France. Uh, which is what uh, Hitler's foreign policy always strove for. So you end up having a situation in which they represent two different uh, forces in Europe, which uh, you know are viewing each other obviously very. They're really a threat to each other. Fortunately for R Stalin, Hitler's anti-Semitism and anti-democracy and anti-decency. Right? We spoke about the fact that a Nazi Germany, in principle, opposed decency. <laughs> You know what they opposed the whole Judeo-Christian ethic, not just Jews. Uh, that itself was dumb because it was a turn off, you understand? It precluded an alliance with, Hitler, with England and France. Uh, this takes us back last year and even two years ago. Hitler unrealistically dreamed all the time, down to his death in 1945 in the bunker, that uh, there's such a union of interests between Germany on the one hand and say England and France and America on the other hand against Russia, that sooner or later they're going to wake up. And that even though the Jews control 
England and America and all these places. But sooner or later, the non-Jews will break through this stranglehold that they have on the media and on the uh, idea formation, and they'll see that the true interests really lie with Germany, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he was clueless because at that time, the people, for one reason or another, in America and in England, thought Hitler was like a monster. Right? That's what they're convinced of. So there was no way that he could combine a plan of killing six million Jews, for example, with an alliance with America. He was out in cuckoo land. And Stalin was very smart. He knew that. Okay? And he was able to utilize that in his international politics. So we have quite a story that we're dealing with here. Stalin very craftily lured Hitler into attacking Poland, but Stalin himself never declared war in Poland. Therefore, he precluded Russia getting into war with England and France, if you understand what I just said. Meaning that in 1939, the Hitler-Stalin pact, uh, Hitler thought he was being very clever. He declared war in Poland. So that England and France declared war on him. Stalin never declared war on Poland. He just came in and took it. So Lamaisi never got into a situation where he's actually at war with England and France. That made it that he never did get into war with them. Hitler, to his frustration, was never able to get out of that war with England and France and eventually the other countries. And so A thought he suckered B, but B really suckered A. That's how it goes in these uh, constant shifting uh, powers. Stalin figured that having lured the other European powers into a war with each other, they would bleed each other to death, just like happened in the First World War. And then when the two sides exhausted each other, he'd, mo they, he'd move in. So this often happens in history that people always imagine that this war is going to be a repeat of the last war, whereas in reality, of course, it never is. Uh, and so what happened in World War I? For four years, the English and the French on this side, the Germans on this side, wiped each other out, like in the movies, right? They charged the uh, trenches and the machine guns that got wiped out, and then they charged the trenches and the machine guns that got wiped out. And they would bleed each other to death, and then the Russians would be ready, not having entered the war whatsoever, and they'd pick up the pieces. But France collapsed immediately, leaving Stalin exposed. They knows Hitler did not repeat this. He had a blitzkrieg in 1940, wiped out France like that, uh, completely disintegrating the balance of power, and leaving him free, as we all know, to attack Russia, which is what he did. Okay? Um, so, uh, furthermore, Hitler successfully attacked Russia at the beginning. He surprised attacked Stalin, which is a shock, who had spies everywhere, but we, as I mentioned last year, it happened. And as a result, Russia suffered colossal losses in the Second World War. I mean, you know, tens of millions of, uh, of people, as, as we know. Um, and what happened in the course of the Second World War, now I'm speaking very cynically tonight, but that is the world. But what happened in the Second World War, in fact, was uh, Franklin Roosevelt did the Stalin what Stalin was trying to do to the others. If you want to understand the Second World War, reduced to its essence. You understand? Uh, Roosevelt let Stalin and Hitler wipe each other out. As Churchill put it, each side clawed the guts out of the other. In the years 1941 to 1944, there was no second front. As soon as the war started, the communists in this country and elsewhere said there has to be a second front. Let America and Britain land an army in France to fight the Germans. They said, we'll get wiped out. Stalin's a big deal, but you should set a second front anyway. Okay, you want to talk like that? Yeah, we'll do it the day after tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. They never did it. You understand? There's a whole story about it, but it didn't happen. And so in 1941, 42, 43, and 44, until June, as we all know, until D-Day of 1944, uh, there was no second front. And basically, the Americans and the British got into the war in a big way when it wasn't really necessary anymore. <laughs> By 1944, June of 44, the German army was already in full retreat from the Russians, fighting very hard. But uh, they weren't going to beat Russia at that point. Russia was on the offensive. And uh, to be perfectly honest, if you want to play armchair strategist, if we never did land in D-Day, and if America and Britain never did fight in France, and you know that whole campaign, uh, Russia would have won anyway. You see, after gigantic losses. So in effect, the Soviets did the massive dying and the devastation, and the Americans who supplied them uh, watched untouched from the sidelines. True or not? And so uh, Stalin uh, grit his teeth. Uh, the Russians very angry. Of course, it's the what they call it, the pot calling the kettle black. Uh, you're doing to us 
something that's unconscionable. Of course, you're doing to you what you wanted to do to the others. Um, and so, you know, history is kind of weird in this regard. This is reflected in very simple numbers. How many troops did America lose in the European theater of operations in World War II? How many Americans were killed uh, in, in, the, in the Hitler fronts? 250,000. How many Russians? 25 million. It's 100 to 1. Now if you put the soldiers and civilians in there. Gee, uh, those numbers are kind of interesting, aren't they? Uh, but Roosevelt was so smooth and so helpful and considerate. And this is true. Uh, he bent over backwards to do everything short of starting a second front. He gave the Russians a ton of stuff. He gave it for free. He gave them extra. Um, he always spoke about the heroism of the Russians. Uh, he really, uh, you know, more than considerate. Uh, when Stalin wanted extra territory, I said, okay, you know, you can have the extra territory. I'm not saying he's right or wrong. I'm just saying this is what, what happened over here. And it's really cool. I'm going to show you now a film clip I just saw the other day. You know, now everything's on the YouTube. The most famous Stalinist movie was, public, was made in 1949. The first Soviet color movie called The Fall of Berlin. My mother told me about it when I was a kid. It was an iconic Soviet film. And obviously you can understand it's about the heroic Russian army. It's propaganda. Heroic Russian army uh, fighting and, and taking all the way to Berlin, which they did do, no question about it. And they fought and bled like crazy. No question under that part is true. On the other hand, it's pure, it's under, it was made under Stalin. It's just pure Stalinist propaganda. Uh, I'm not a movie critic here tonight. You just see the end, and you'll see literally a Zara. Because, you know, at the end of the battle, Stalin flies in a plane dressed in white, and they come over to him like he's a god. It's, it's just unbelievable. You understand? Because uh, communism in the Stalinist time really was an Avodazara. I mean, it sounds like I'm using a funny cliche, but uh, they speak of him, and, and they always present him in godlike terms. Uh, it's amazing. You recall that Karl Marx, of course, said, that uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. But George Bernard Shaw said that uh, Marxism is the opiate of the intellectuals. And uh, this is an example right, <laughs> of the fact that people wanted something to believe in. And uh, belief is the key word which is presented in the mass media. Now, I'm not showing you this whole movie. I'm showing you a small clip. But my point is, this is pure Stalinist propaganda uh, in which he is portrayed as the great wise Stalin who can do nothing wrong. And uh, it's the Yalta Conference. It's just a Russian movie made in 1945 in which a piece of it you're going to see is the Yalta Conference. It's in Russian with English subtitles. And the point they're trying to make over here is Roosevelt was dead in 1949, as you know. Uh, but they still, uh, you'll see Churchill is portrayed as, as a, a schmo, right? Uh, a bum. Uh, trying to get Stalin to toast the King of England, which by Soviet standards is like heresy. And Roosevelt will be the gentleman and will say, no, instead of toasting the King of England, let us toast Kalinin, who of course is the Soviet foreign minister, uh, I mean the Soviet president. And the idea they're sending out, because every single item in the movies is propagandized and calculated to lay effect on the Soviet watchers and the people, is Roosevelt was a good guy. Um, True, he bled us like <laughs> he bled us to death, uh, but he, but he was so nice. <laughs> you understand? He's such a gentleman. Isn't it a shame he had to die and the Cold War had to begin? But Roosevelt was a tzaddik. Uh, here, take a look at this. You see, of course, the Stalin Roosevelt. I, I assume you know the characters. That's Churchill talking. Я прошу вас выпить здоровья армейского короля. Так, а? Я против монархии, господин Черчилль, вы это знаете. Я вам гость, господин Сталин, я вас очень прошу. Ну, если это вам так и нужно, я готов сделать вам приятно. За чье здоровье? That's Roosevelt, of course. Я предлагаю тост за короля. А я пью. So what's the point? You know, so from popular culture, you see a velt, as they say in yeshiva. And um, really, I can tell you not a single sentence in these Stalinist movies is done without full thinking of the effect it'll have. Rosa was a nice guy, right? 
By the way, they never show him in the movie in a wheelchair. So he's sitting down. Again, if the Russians wanted to dig him, uh, they do it. It's very interesting over here. So in cold, hard terms, what happens is that um, FDR made it his business to give Stalin no room for getting angry. And it kind of worked. They gave him tremendous respect and all that kind of business. And uh, indeed, uh, when they had the, you know, uh, they met twice at the Tehran conference in 1943 and at the Yalta conference in 1945. And Stalin got most of what he asked for. Uh, he said, I want to hold on to Eastern Europe, particularly Poland, places like this. And Roosevelt said, uh, OK, uh, just don't tell the Polish Americans that I said OK. That's really true. He says, you know, I have elections coming up and things like this, but between you and me, you know, we, we, we won't make a big deal out of it. And uh, once again, so how can you get angry at them? In other words, what I'm trying to get at is that FDR really did not want a Cold War to happen. He said, we've got to somehow or other work it out with Stalin. Um, I, they're out for world conquest and all this kind of stuff. Let's try to get around that if, if we possibly can. And indeed, uh, here you see the real pictures of the big three. Roosevelt's dying over here. He was dead a few weeks later. I told you he had high blood pressure and heart trouble and this and that and the other. He's still smoking <laughs> on the picture. And uh, he, he was only 62. And um, it's a representation for the cameras of the fact that uh, we're getting along. No Cold War. Right? We'll work it out. Uh, Churchill, of course, was very angry at the whole thing. It's bring it's Churchill over next to him, bring uh, in Europe and part of England with the balance of power tradition. Is Russia getting too strong? Uh, you know they're they're, they're taking over uh, Europe, uh, but Poland, these other places, it's going to threaten the rest of Europe. And Roosevelt kept saying, eh, "We'll work it out, you know, whatever." Now, Stalin was no fool, obviously, and he told. Try not to hit it. Stalin was no fool, and he told Milovan Gilas, who was a well-known Yugoslavian communist who later on wrote about all this, he said, you know the difference between Roosevelt and Churchill is a Churchill will steal a penny. Roosevelt only goes for a $5 bill. You understand? Which means he knew that Russia had been bled dry by all this sort of thing, but, uh, and Roosevelt wasn't getting involved in small, petty areas, but in the large general picture, um, you know, adversary. On the other hand, of the Red Army did conquer Eastern Europe, including Eastern Germany. America and Britain were very nervous over this in 1945, particularly when it was evident that Stalin meant to stay there, to add them to his empire, to impose totalitarianism, and use them as potential bases for his next attempt to conquer the rest of Europe. Because this is what happened. Uh, this is, roughly speaking, the Cold War that you and I remember. Uh, here's all the areas that the Red Army took over in Europe, all the Balkans, and, you know, it's half of Germany and Poland and Romania and Hungary and Czechoslovakia and all that kind of business, and it's not that far from here to here, right? No, it's not, not too much to take over the rest of Europe. Uh, this is just an existential uh, fact. So um, it was a danger, and the Russians were not pulling out. In other words, if you follow everything I've said now for the last uh, so and so many minutes, Hitler had the effect of wrecking Stalin's original plan. Uh, Hitler profoundly weakened the USSR. Get it? Uh, when the Second World War was over, it wasn't so easy to conquer the world. Uh, they had, i say, 25 million uh, dead, then another 25 million that they killed on their own, if you want to get down to it. Uh, there were, the the uh, industry had been destroyed in the fighting. Uh, you know, uh, look how many families were wrecked. Uh, the agriculture, you just, you know, uh, Russia had been profoundly, uh, you know, weakened by all this sort of thing. Um, and, you know, Stalin's real angry because he has this big army, but he can't really take on America. He's not strong enough. Uh, the U.S. emerged from the Second World War unscathed. <laughs> and they never did bomb over here. Uh, they never got close. Uh, the, the amount of losses that we suffered, not that every person who died is not important, but relatively speaking, uh, it was very light. Um, Roosevelt really took the country very successfully uh, through the war. I can tell you that President Roosevelt and General Marshall were very, very careful all through the war about keeping the casualties down when possible. Um, when there were big casualties, they didn't even deliver to the newspapers, you know, they didn't a minute to later. And so America and England, 
fought a very cautious kind of war. A Russian did not fight that kind of war. Maybe they didn't have the opportunity, but they didn't fight that kind of war. And so what I'm trying to say is, now that Germany was defeated, the balance of power realities reasserts itself, and it's America versus Russia. These are the two uh, adversaries. Um, America, as we'll see over here in a second, well, I'll just tell you right now, immediately demobilizes. Russia does not. The American tradition, going back to George Washington, is no army. Uh, that's the way we've had it for a long time. Not in my lifetime and yours, but in American history up to the Second World War, up to 1950 to be exact. Uh, the old tradition in American history is you do not have an army of the tiniest possible army. Um, in George Washington's time, there was no army except a few thousand to fight the Indians. Uh, Alexander Hamilton wanted to build up an army, and John a Adams uh, abolished it. And Thomas Jefferson and these guys definitely abolished it. In the War of 1812, uh, the U.S. and War of Mexican War, the American army very, very tiny. Uh, when we fought the Mexican War, I think the whole American army was 30,000 men. With, with that, they conquered California and you know New Mexico and all that business. Uh, the Civil War is an exception because of its nature, and so the North raised a million men, the South, I don't know, 600,000, something like that, because of the nature of the Civil War. And uh, by the end of the Civil War, General Grant had uh, over a million men under his command. There was actually a little draft over here in this country, very unusual in American history, but the draft was done in the following way. If you don't want to, <laughs> if you don't want to uh, serve, pay $100, they'll get a substitute. Okay. So, uh, well, in Vietnam they did it differently, but it's the same effect. Uh, and so the, what I'm trying to show you is throughout the 1800s, the uh, same thing with the, uh, the Spanish-American War, uh, no army. Uh, in, in, if you went back to the year 1900 or so, the whole American army, uh, with the expansion was uh, 30, 40,000 men, something like that. When you consider we have a continent over here, and more, I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing, nothing. Uh, the First World War? How long would that last? Uh, a year and a half, less than a year and a half. We got into war in April of 1917. It was over in November of 1918. So they raised real fast millions and millions of men. And then immediately, when the war was over, uh, they totally dissolved it. Uh, the generals, like Pershing, wanted America to have a full-time peace army of 300,000 men. They didn't, they didn't get less than 100,000. This is the American way. And I'm not saying it's dumb. Uh, they're afraid of, 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 of generals with big armies, right? possible dictatorship. And second of all, who wants to spend the money on this? This is the old American tradition. When World War II came along, they put together 11 million men and women. Eight million in the Army and three million in the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines, and the Coast Guard. Uh, as soon as the Second World War was over, Truman, who came totally out of this tradition, uh, and the Congress, uh, dissolved the Army. And in the years that I'm talking about, 1945, 46, 47, 48, the Army and the Armed Forces was in free fall. Uh, they were constantly, I mean, you know, people have no idea of, you know, some of these surplus, you know, all the unbelievable amount of stuff that they just buried in the ocean, the weapons. Uh, all the soldiers were dismissed, the weapons are destroyed, uh, you know, the uniforms were sold, you know, for, for the public. Uh, they just dismantled the whole business, okay? And so uh, they kept a small garrison in Germany and a small garrison in Japan in those years really small. Um, they didn't need much. Uh, the Germans and Japanese were not going to rebel against America. They wanted the American army. They were scared of the Russians. You understand? Um, I might point out to you that there are still American garrisons in Germany and Japan today. And that means that those countries don't find their presence uncongenial. Otherwise, we wouldn't be there. True? I mean, it's 65 years since the end of World War II, and we still have military bases in Germany and Japan. And the Germans want them and the Japanese want them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. Um, you will recall that at the end of the Second World War, uh, we poured a ton of money into Germany and Japan and other places like that. Uh, they loved the American soldiers there. Uh, they didn't want them to leave. So you didn't have to have a large force. You just had to have some, symbolically. Uh, if anybody's old enough to remember, they used to have a movie when I was a kid, The Mouse That Roared. Okay? And what was that about? Uh, a small country like Luxembourg, I haven't seen this in, since in, in 50 years, I don't know, whatever. Uh, I saw it in seventh grade or eighth grade in TA in an assembly. Now, the, uh, what do you call it, a small country attacks America so that they'll lose and get the, get the foreign aid. Except, 
I just remember somehow or other they won. You know, that was supposed to be a British comedy. The point, though, is that was th th that's one reality, okay? And Truman was totally part of this. Uh, let me tell you that, uh, as I say, they were in free fall, and that didn't change till 48, 49. And even then, because of traditional American uh, values, uh, Truman wanted the armed forces very small. It's very famous, and when he got reelected, he could do really whatever he wanted. Um, how, I won't even ask this question. How big was the whole defense budget at that time? $15 billion, which was nothing. And the Army and Navy and the Air Force, everybody complained. It's what they called the revolt of the generals and the revolt of the admirals. Truman wanted to abolish the Marine Corps. He, for seven years, he fought to abolish the Marine Corps uh, and things like this. And so, it was, you know, this was traditional American values. Only when the Korean War hit, they <coughs> turned around. And so we need a constant, large, permanent standing army. Then we have the gigantic defense budgets that you and I know of today. Right. So this is one thing. Now, Stalin, on the other hand, uh, the opposite. I mean, he released a lot of people from the army because right then they didn't need him, but he immediately went into a mode in which he said, we've got to get ready for the next war. We have to rebuild all the industry that was destroyed. I'm talking about the military industry. He didn't say, let's start making cars and, and refrigerators. Um, the Russian people, starving in 1945. You understand that, after what they went through. Uh, the little that they ate, in 1941 to 45, a lot of it came from America for free food. A Roosevelt, I tell you again, sent over a ton of food. The Russian army had spam and all this stuff all the time. It's what they did. But we send over, I mean, Baruch Hashem, America has plenty that they can give away. True? And they did give away a ton of money for free. It's called Lend Lease. And so uh, the Russian, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the uh, transport and the food and things like this was coming. Uh, from America as part of the alliance during the Second World War. But the day the war ended, America cut it off. Uh, Truman said that, and Roosevelt wanted the same thing over. The ships, even on the way to Russia, turned around. And so there's no more food, and no more this, and no more that coming in, so Russia's going to be really hungry. Stalin does not care. We've got to get ready for the next war. And so uh, the people will be kept on a starvation diet for the rest of his life from 1945 to 1953, so that Russia can massively rearm and we want to fight America. Uh, so um, in these years, they, they will eventually build the A-bomb on their own. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. How much does it cost to build an atomic bomb, even today, but especially in those days? It was a gigantic effort on the part of America during the Second World War. They spent money like water to do this because it was a war necessity. Uh, Stalin will also spend a ton of resources on it, which they cannot afford. Uh, they will also need to get ready to fight America. You have to do such things as transatlantic bombers I think people don't know this so well. The Russians invented the, uh, the, 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 the bombers that could start in Russia and bomb New York and whatever and go back. Um, all this eventually got surpassed by the missiles. <laughs> but this kind of high tech, high price that sort of thing begins in Russia right away. And so uh, you end up having a situation where you have one country that uh, has totally demobilized, that's America. You have another country that's going the opposite direction that's totally mobilizing as a gigantic army. But on the other hand, America has an atomic bomb. And in the years I'm talking about, Russia didn't have the atomic bomb. And so that kind of balanced things out. And so we go back to a rough equivalency, which uh, is what the years 1945, 1990 was all about. We, nobody knew if we're stronger than them or vice versa. Now, America resents Russia holding on to Eastern Europe. I would say that this was a strategic mistake on the part of Russia because they didn't have to hold on to these countries. They just could have kept their army there and let them do whatever they want. But that's not how Stalin saw it. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I mean, the, the Stalinist system, as I told you before, could not really survive without world conquest. At the same time, America did not want to go to war against Russia. That's just a fact. You understand? Uh, there were a few guys that wanted to go to war against Russia, like Patton, <laughs> right? But Eisenhower fired him for that very reason. You know, so he said, one war is, is enough, thank you very much. Um, and so President Truman definitely wanted peace. So did the other elites. All they wanted to do in America was demobilize and usher in an unprecedented prosperity. It was hard to shift from a war economy to a regular economy. And there was also a lot of sympathy in 1945 and 46 for the gallant Russians, because let's face it, we all know they did fight a hard fight against Hitler. But you can't take away from them their heroism. Right? That's a fact. Um, and as soon as the war was over, 
uh, the three sides got together at the Potsdam Conference in Berlin, Stalin and, 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 uh, and Truman, and uh, Churchill and Attlee, you know, whoever, and uh, they tried to patch over their differences. Uh, this is an attempt to make sure there will not be a Cold War. Uh, it didn't work, of course. But at least in 1945, 46, and 47, they're trying. Right? The problem is that Russia's totalitarian brutality in Eastern Europe was a bone that's, that, that, that will stick in the throats of the West. And Stalin didn't hop this in the same way that Hitler did. He figured, you know, Russia's very powerful, and as long as he's in the pictures and everybody's smiling, everything's okay. Uh, but it wasn't. And the bottom line is he was planning for an, another war. With unbelievable ruthlessness, he subjected his people to all the starving, and as I told you, built all these weapons. So during the years 1945-47, and we'll see next week, that's when the real Zionist struggle takes place. At that very time, um, Truman and American policy in general was, uh, was highly conflicted. Okay? Can I move to? Yeah, here's a uh, conference held by uh, the General Marshal, the Secretary of State, with Molotov in, in Moscow in 1947, still trying to work things out. And General Marshal, who was the commander of the army, became the Secretary of State under Truman, and they, they want there should not be a conflict. Uh, the reality didn't work that way. But in these years, uh, n nobody in America wants to have World War III. Let's put it th that way, okay? Uh, that's how it, it, it worked. Um, but little by little, the American power elites were going to, uh, by the way, uh, somewhere over there was Mrs. Molotov again, if you want to see it, but anyway. Uh, so here's the, here are the decision makers in America at that time, the State Department machers, and particularly this guy, George Kennan. Uh, he's the only one who was a straight thinker, a very brilliant thinker, unfortunately anti-Semitic, but he was very uh, clear thinker, and he crystallized American thinking during these years and created a shita. And that became uh, the shita of America, their opinion, and that's containment. And, the, and it wasn't wrong. He was right. He was a very brilliant guy. And uh, he said basically the, the, the communist system can't continue to exist unless it expands. As long as you just prevent it from taking over the world, it will implode. You and I today, with 2020 hindsight, said he was 45. Yeah, he was exactly right. He wrote this in 1947. 40 years later, Mamish, 40 years later, it happened. It was a tough 40 years. And we almost blew each other up a couple times, but it happened. As long as the Soviet system couldn't you know, take over the world, you all know that communism doesn't work. Some people here may have been in Soviet Russia. I was. Some people know, read about it anyway. I mean, they didn't have toilet paper. You know, I mean, it, was, it was crazy. They didn't have food. And so it did implode. But I'm talking about the period when this is all beginning to. A containment uh, during the administration of Truman was taken literally, uh, meaning you really want to keep Russia and its allies from going anywhere outside of where they are. And in the, in the Truman administration, uh, they were able to do this. Later on, they were not. I'll give you just an example I'm talking about. There was no such thing as Castro's Cuba in the time I'm talking about. The Russians are just in Russia and Eastern Europe. They're not going anywhere if, if America can help it. You understand? Now, uh, uh, this, of course, all this leads us to the Middle East. Basically, check out the map here. This is Russia and the Russian allies, all this area in red. This is Russia. Here is the Middle East. Here is uh, the countries of Palestine and uh, at that time in Jordan and Iraq and Syria and Saudi Arabia and Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. You all know what I'm talking about. If you look at the map closely, you'll see Russia can't get into here without going through either here or here. This is Turkey. This is Iran. In order to get through to the Middle East, where all the oil and everything is, you have to go through, you have to conquer or whatever, take over Turkey or take over Iran. Uh, indeed, in 1946, Stalin tried to do that. He tried to bully Turkey and Iran, and Truman stopped him. This is what they call the Truman Doctrine. Okay? Without going through all the details, but America basically stepped up and said, if you go into there, it'll be a war and all this kind of stuff. In 1947, very famously, Truman went to Congress and he announced the Truman Doctrine, which means we'll give zillions if necessary. Uh, to keep the Russians out of Turkey and Iran. And as uh, the Secretary of State at that time said, you have to explain this to the American people in such a way that you will scare the hell out of the American people. That's his language that he used. And he did. Okay? And so uh, Turkey and Iran, the outer ring of the Middle East, hold. But what about the Arab states themselves? Now, so what's to stop the Russians? Oops. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. There we go. What's to stop the Russians, you know, going this way? Well, the Turks won't let them here. Or going this way? In other words, figuring some way to get at the Arab states themselves in another way, which later they did. And the answer to that is that in the period I'm talking about, at the end of the Second World War, uh, all the Arab regimes were pro-Western states, and they were anti-communist, which is the way it is. They're also corrupt, but they're corrupt today also. Uh, so, for example, Egypt was held by King Farouk, who was a big playboy and uh, lived a high life, and uh, he's anti-communist. He doesn't like the British, but, you know, he's anti-communist. Uh, same thing with the, Abdullah, the king of Jordan, the Saudi Arabia, uh, Iraq, and Syria at this time were actually parliamentary countries in Lebanon, but they were held by traditionalist elites who are very Islamic and pro. They, you know, they have certain relations with England and America, but they're very anti-communist. In other words, all the Arab countries at the period I'm talking about in the late 40s are um, at least anti-communist and to some degree another pro-West. So they're on our side and they're not on theirs. And the Russians ain't getting into there and taking over Saudi Arabia because the Saudi Arabians are scared to death of the communists, at least King Saud is, and that's the way we want it. Okay? Now, I spent all this time to sort of set all this up. If you understand what I've been saying so far, uh, then you'll, you'll understand the perfectly understandable point of view of the State Department, of these guys, right? Because all they're saying is, do not rock the boat in the Middle East. The existing status quo is the optimal situation for America, and therefore for the cause of freedom. Why endanger all that for the sake of Zionism? Of course they said the Shoah was a tragedy, but tragedies occur. The USA is still the best friend of the Jewish people, but the USA does not want to endanger its Middle Eastern flank in the developing Cold War. Do, would you agree that makes sense? You see? From the Russian point of view, I mean, excuse me, from the American point of view, I keep the Russians out. Now, the problem, of course, is it derives from a bipolar worldview. You know, it's us and the Reds, which reduces everything in the world to two teams and does not take into account the local cultures and the local realities. Now, this kind of thinking ultimately led to, to Vietnam, right? and even to Iraq, arguably, in which it's us and them, and the local conditions don't matter anymore, and we'll save the local country even who have to bomb it. And the result is, we got into situations dealing with cultures and civilizations that we had no idea what we're talking about. Okay? Even to this day, I don't think in America anybody really understands what Vietnam is about. Okay? And that's what happens when you try to reduce everything to, you know, you're my friend or you're his friend. Uh, think about schools, think about society. If everything becomes a question of, are you on my side or his side or her side, it's not a useful way of organizing social relations, I would argue. Um, it also led, by the way, to the American view that anything justified in the war against uh, communism, even if you hire ex-Nazis, to work for America secretly in the war. I mean, this is General Galen, who was Hitler's chief of intelligence on the Eastern Front. The CIA picked him up with a, what they call the OSS. They, 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 they picked him up and brought him to America right after the war in Virginia, yeah. and he helped uh, set up the CIA and uh, continue, fight the war against Russia. Uh, built up the German, uh, what do you call it? The BND, you know, the, the German CIA, as it were, and uh, all full of ex-Nazis and things like this. And who says they're ex-Nazis? And uh, the Cold War being what it was, this guy later became a good friend of Israel in the 1950s. Um, politics and strange bedfellows. Uh, many will remember Werner von Braun, who was Hitler's uh, number one rocket scientist. He's the guy that invented all the rockets that blew up London. But the Americans didn't care. Uh, when the war was over, they said, I guess we're lucky we get him, otherwise Stalin will get him. And he was the guy who helped create all of our missiles that could hit Russia. Uh, who was it? Uh, I forget which poet was says. Now what it was is, I send them up, I don't know where they come down. Those were the last words of Werner von Braun. The, uh, the point is, I don't think it was him, it was somebody earlier, but it doesn't matter. Uh, what I'm, now, now, the government didn't tell this to anybody. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, recognition signals. The, well, the American government didn't tell this to anybody at that time. And the reason is the government would have been appalled. The, the public would be appalled. I would even tell you uh, that Truman was uncomfortable with all this. Um, he understood fully the CIA, I mean the State Department point of view, and went along with most of it, I did most of it, 
But some of it, it was hard for him to swallow. Uh, Dean Anchison, who was probably the most influential foreign policy figure in the Truman administration, he was the Under Secretary of State in the first Truman administration, and the Secretary of State in the second Truman administration, and became a very close personal friend. It's very interesting. I'll speak about this more as we go along, because this will be important in our story about Israel. He a very close friend of Truman uh, till, till, till the day they died. Uh, he is a Harvard Law graduate. He had clerked for Brandeis. You know, he was a real brilliant type of lawyer, and he went into the State Department. And uh, he writes in his memoirs, which are brilliantly written, uh, he says, you know, Truman had a couple of quirks. There were a couple of things that he just didn't feel comfortable with, even though they had to be done. And he wouldn't go along with the State Department. One was General Franco. He didn't like the idea that America has now to kiss up to Spain because it's anti-communist uh, when Franco was a, a pro-Nazi. He didn't like General Perón in Argentina. You know, Eva Perón. Uh, once again, they said, just go along with everybody they do because they're against the, 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 the communists. And he said, but the guys are Nazi. You know, he really, really bothered him. And he couldn't see straight on Israel. That's what that just said, you know. He couldn't understand that the DPs had to be sacrificed uh, to the American national interest in fighting the Cold War. You know? Other than that, Truman was a good guy. But, you know, and it reflects the fact, as I say before, that the American people, during the years I'm talking about, the late 40s, were conflicted in this way. Uh, they were anti-communist, they were also anti-fascist. Okay? There was a strong feeling in this country, reflected once again, as I'll try to show you in a minute, in the popular literature, that uh, the Second World War was indeed uh, a balance of power war, perhaps, but it was a great crusade of freedom. That was Eisenhower's book that he wrote that sold a zillion copies after the Second World War was over. If you had a loved one who perished, as happened in the Second World War, uh, yeah, they, they perished to maintain America's balance of power position in the world, no question about that. But it was much more than that. Uh, they were carbonists in, a, in the most righteous war in history. And in, in, in really, what was to liberate mankind uh, from the threat of totalitarianism. That wasn't true, of course, because he had Stalin, but it's, you know, you get what I'm saying? In other words, it, 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 you run into that problem. But I'm talking about the level of public, public think. This is what people wanted to think. And it's also true to a great extent. I know there's problems with it, but it's also true to a great extent. And anyway, they had certainly been, shall I say, brainwashed, inspired uh, by the um, illustrious rhetoric of Roosevelt who was a great speaker, as you'll see in a second, into the idea that uh, this is a crusade uh, for freedom. It's for mom and apple pie, and America is not a question of being threatened in its continental position, but it's, being, it, it, it's a war for the most sacred of values. Here, check this out. They know that victory for us means victory for freedom. They know that victory for us means victory for the institution of democracy, the ideal of the family, the simple principles of common decency and humanity. They know that victory for us means victory for religion, and they could not tolerate that. The world is too small to provide adequate living room for both Hitler and What's that all about? This is not a balance of power war. This is not a question of will be the strong country on the continent of Europe. This is a victory for, this is a war for God. <laughs> right? And I'll say it again, uh, you can be cynical about it, and perhaps at some level one should be cynical whenever you hear any politician say anything, but it's also not cynical. Right? I mean, it, it, is, it is real, and, it's, uh, and it, when the war was over, uh, these were just facts in the mind of the American people. Uh, this is going to be represented wonderfully in the last clip that I'm going to show. Uh, no, not the last, one, the second last clip I'm going to show you tonight. Uh, they found from a famous Hollywood picture, war picture, 1949, same year as the other one, exactly in this period, Battleground. Uh, Van Johnson, <coughs> names of old, uh, about the Battle of the Bolts. And it was famous at that time as the all the critics said, this is a very realistic uh, war picture. It wasn't about glory and all that kind of stuff, but what it was really like to be a GI fighting in the battle, of, you know, the freezing cold and all that kind of business. Uh, now I'm not giving you that whole business. There's a clip there, a very famous one, which is, in, to my mind, iconically representative of American popular feeling 
uh, among the broad public at, at, in the wake of the Second World War, exactly in the time when Israel became a state. And it is, first of all, I'll just tell you real briefly, uh, you know, you see a chaplain uh, performing services uh, in December for the soldiers, but it's that old post-war feeling that it doesn't matter, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish are all the same. And most importantly, he's going to say like this, uh, don't feel like you were a sucker in this war because you uh, fought in the war uh, to uh, conquer fascism. Right? So it's not a war for a balance of power. Take a look at this. In my mind, that's a, a perfect capturing a codec moment of American popular mood, uh, which Hollywood sometimes is, at the, in the period at the end of the Second World War. Um, so it wasn't for the balance of power, it was a war against the dictatorship and fascism. Now, let's bring this to Israel. In the struggle for statehood, these anti-fascist feelings will be among the Zionists' most potent weapons, and will in the end Trump, the cold logic of the cold warriors, and it will lead to Medinat Yisrael. In the end, as I hope I'll be able to uh, explain in the future, um, it will come down to a confrontation in 1947-48 between the two personifications of the two competing schools of thought. Uh, Truman representing that movie, and General Marshall representing the logic, uh, I would say, you know, you can't blame him, the logic of the balance of power and, and, and the demands of national security. In other words, in the question of whether America should support uh, the Zionist drive, it will be a battle of heart versus mind. And uh, heart will win, as we know, but mind will stubbornly insist it was right. And I'll conclude tonight with what you may find to be a, a something of a disturbing uh, clip that I just fortuitously saw, picked up the other day, um, in which you'll see uh, John McCain running in the last election, and he wants to name this guy, I don't know who he is, Fred Smith, to be the next Secretary of Defense. Uh, I'm sure many of you know he's better than I do, 
and uh, the guy will interview uh, Fred Smith, and he'll say, oh, do you think it was right uh, that America uh, supported uh, the establishment of the State of Israel? Name a person that you think would be appropriate, one of four or five, to run the Pentagon. The Pentagon. Take Fred, that. Fred, Fred Smith. United States Marine Federal Corps. Express guy, right? Federal Express. Uh, uh, He's the kind of guy you'd like to see run the Pentagon. Sure. Marshall's uh, amazing uh, managerial capabilities that really was the most important element in winning World War II, I believe. But he advised Truman against recognizing the state of Israel. Well, uh, in retrospect, uh, there would be a large body of thought that would uh, have said uh, that Marshall was correct in what would uh, precipitate from that recognition, which is now 60-some-odd years of war. Of all the people you know who most reminds you of George Marshall. Well, I would say in a lot of ways, John McCain has a lot of uh, traits like uh, uh, George Marshall. So you never know what's going on really in politics. I don't say he's right or wrong, but I say you never know what's going on in politics. Uh, if, it, if it was a battle of heart versus mind, uh, the mind will always argue that in important things in life, it's wrong to follow the heart. Um, Truman will disagree. The history of the last 65 years or whatever in American politics is very interesting in terms of this existential tension uh, between the heart and the mind. Um, I leave you that, with that thought tonight to uh, chew and uh, think about uh, before we proceed uh, next